All right, as usual, what do you remember from the last lecture? Somebody has been free typing this. The Thurial machine learning and describing the security properties. All right, threat modeling, yep. Anything else, anything specific you remember? Any insights? Different kinds of attacks, right? So we talked about poisoning attacks and evasion attacks. Building a surrogate model um, to help with the attacks, right? Uh, when there's a black box model, we talked about how you can access or influence a model to different forms of how you might be manipulating the data. And then one thing maybe also to mention that I try to bring across at least is that it's not just at the model level, we talked about robustness, uh, for example, right? But it's really also about how you design the entire system. Like, can you build in defenses like making predictions more expensive that it's harder to just get a large number of predictions to build a surrogate model? Can you build in some trust mechanism that you know which input data or telemetry data to trust, right? For example, by checking that long-term users are more trusted than new users, making it harder to attack, things like this. Um, I had one short part that I didn't uh, get to cover, but I want to mention this at least briefly, um, intellectual, stealing intellectual property and um, privacy concerns. Um, this was in the reading, um, uh, on the prediction machine book that um, Bing was caught stealing uh, search results essentially from um, Google, right? So they, they intercepted in the Bing search engine or in the Bing search bar uh, search queries and then asked for Google, asked the Google search engine what the results were and incorporated this into their own results. They were caught by uh, returning, essentially with a honey trap, uh, responding to nonsensical search queries with things that were specifically set up by Google. But it, in general, this is an example of how an attacker might steal kind of the model by just having enough queries, right? So if you have the model public, it's possible to build a surrogate model. How easy that is depends a little bit on the deployment scenario. Um, in some cases, you might ship the model with the app and then somebody can just look at, decompile it or look at all the parameters of a model, right? How the decision is made. Uh, but even if you deploy it online, somebody might just query uh, a model frequently, build a surrogate model. Um, you can <clears throat> protect against this to some degree by rate limiting people, making it harder to ask lots of queries. But in the end, you're providing answers for certain inputs, right? So you can't arbitrarily protect against this. Um, and then these surrogate models, this is why we talked about them last time, uh, are useful for a bunch of other attacks. For example, if you try to find adversarial attacks, adversarial examples, it's much more useful if you have access to the model, if you can build a surrogate model, right, than just blindly trying. So I don't think there is really a much you can do at the model level. Uh, if you're worried about leaking intellectual property, leaking the model itself, um, this is actually something um, where you need to think about your system design, how much are you exposing an API, how easy do you make it for others to, um, to access us. Um, does somebody remember or have seen this, um, how Netflix had privacy problems in their competitions, what the issues were? So Netflix was running these competitions for recommendations uh, where they released information about a large number of their customers anonymized uh, about what movies they were watching and how they were rating this, similar to what you're doing kind of. Um, and then the competition was to build a prediction machine that predicts uh, ratings or recommends ratings as best as possible. And there were complaints that it was possible to identify users in that data set, even though uh, they didn't attach names <clears throat> to the rows, 
Right, so um, the specific case I think that was um, litigated here or the, where the complaint was about um, was a, a gay woman who had, who was closeted, who didn't want to share this, but um, it was leaking kind of her preferences and the kind of movies that she liked and so on. Because if you could see a few movies that she liked, you could identify the person in the data set um, with high probability and kind of see more information. So more broadly, it's, it's really hard to really anonymize data sets if you share them. There's lots of problems with that. Um, and it's fairly easy often to identify people with a few attributes and kind of leak privacy information. Even if you don't share the original data, uh, there are certain risks. Um, there are things called model inversion attacks. How you, even, don't, even if you don't have access to the data, you can ask queries of the model to kind of reproduce or approximate some of the training data. There have been multiple examples of this. This is a visual example where they, um, I think this was a training data, a training image, and this was, they were able to kind of reverse engineer, having the model reverse engineer information about the training data. There are a couple of other examples where it was possible just on a trained model on medical diagnosis or on DNA sequences to reverse engineer um, some of the input data or at least approximate some of the input data used to train the model. Um, this can be pushed pre pretty far. Um, so there are lots of examples where sharing um, data, even though it was thought to be anonymized, went wrong. Right? This is really hard. Uh, this is, I think, more of an academic problem, probably. Um, and then model inversion attacks, there are lots of, lots of these examples as well. Does somebody know how uh, generative adversarial networks work? I suspect if you've done some machine learning class, they may have come up. Maybe you've even run some examples. Anybody? These are the kind of things that can generate deep fakes. So the idea here is that you try to learn how to generate images that look like real images. So here's an example of a picture that a machine learning system has generated. It's not a real photograph. This woman doesn't exist, but it's learned to look like a real photograph, like something that we would recognize. Roughly the idea how this works is that you have two models working against each other and training uh, each other. So you start with a set of real images and a set of fake images. So you have some generator that generates fake images. This might just be random noise in the beginning. And then you learn a model based on some sample that is able to distinguish real images from fake images. Right? So you're training with some labeled examples of real images and labeled examples of wrong images. You learn, you're training this discriminator model. It might be a deep neural network that just this discriminator model essentially decides, is this a real image or is this a fake image, right? You're starting with some training data and maybe some more obvious fakes. And then you're essentially trying to get into a feedback loop. So the generator is trying to attack the discriminator kind of as adversarial examples, try to come up with examples that the discriminator accepts as real images. If the discriminator loses, then the discriminator gets updated because we have detected a generated image that gets classified as a real image. And we can retrain the discriminator with another fake image, right? And the fake image that we're retraining this is probably closer to the things, uh, to real images. And we, when we repeat this over and over again, this generator will generate better and better images that are closer to real images, right? Because it's the discriminator is getting better at distinguishing good from bad images. 
So the generator needs to get better at generating fake examples that pass, that kind of get slipped by the discriminator and so on. Does this general architecture make sense? This is a fairly standard one that has been developed the last couple of years ago. And I think this is, this is how a lot of the kind of the deep fake pictures and kind of uh, artificial pictures that look like real are generated. Right? So what we're doing this way is, again, we're generating fake things that look somewhat similar to the training data that maybe look like prototypical inputs, right? They are not really training data, but we're maybe leaking characteristics. We are having possible other properties because we can imitate people, can imitate real things. For privacy, there are a couple of um, protection strategies. Again, this is an area where there's a ton of research, mostly very close to the model level, um, like adversarial, like these gens, uh, general, generative adversarial networks. There's a huge amount of research on this, on how to make this harder, how to make this better. Also about privacy, how to avoid inversion attacks, how to avoid leaking and so on. How to learn in a privacy assuring way. I can't go into this, but I can give you, and I'm not an expert on any of these, but I, the, the main three directions that people seem to work on is federated learning, where you learn local models for example, this is, this is actually used in production in some cases, like the Android keyboards or Apple emoji prediction, where you learn local models on, on the person's um, phones. So the data of what they are typing on their keyboards, uh, which emojis they are using directly doesn't leave the phone. You're learning something local, but then you're merging this data in an anonymized way uh, without being able to identify individual people. There's a lot of research on this, how you can learn global models without having access to all data, without having identifiable access to individuals. Um, differential privacy is a very broadly researched kind of formal notion where you say, um, if you're looking at data, at training data, you're not able to identify any individual. Um, so there's different notions of how much, um, how easy or how close you can identify somebody. Typically this the, the defense happens by injecting specific noise into the training data that you can no longer uh, identify individuals. And then there's a lot of formal research on homomorphic encryption where you can essentially encrypt the data and still compute on encrypted data. So the computation, the machine learning algorithm never sees the unencrypted data, but it still works. Um, so a lot of this is cutting edge research and very formal research. Um, some of the stuff makes it into production into kind of smaller settings like the Android keyboard. They're, they're kind of few examples of production use. Um, I would expect that there's more to come, um, that there's more attention, but this is also very specific where I think um, this is probably something that as a software engineer, you don't want to take completely over. It's more useful to know that these things exist and then work with a data scientist who specializes in these areas to, to implement what you need. Uh, and usually you have some accuracy and performance trade-off. So a bunch of these at like lower accuracy, like if you introduce noise at the, into the uh, training process, right? You increase privacy, but lower accuracy. Some of them require quite a bit of performance overhead or you need to have a certain architecture of how you're learning and so on. Does this make sense kind of as a rough overview? All right, this is all I have for security. I kind of want to switch to safety now, which is the main focus of today. Um, safety just broadly is kind of preventing system failure that results in harm, that results in hazards. Um, where we typically talk about things like death or serious in injury to people, but also loss of or severe damage to property um, and also harm to society or the environment. So pollution, for example, even noise pollution would be considered as a safety problem. Um, kind of causing mental health issues would be considered as a safety problem, right? So it's not just a self-driving car that might run you over and kill you um, or the robot uprising. 
um, safety has kind of a pretty wide net. And maybe just briefly, safety is not the same as reliability. Reliability typically looks at a single component, how often it fails, and we can harden a single component. Safety is much more at the system perspective, uh, making sure that if a component fails, we still have a fail-safe mechanism. We have a, um, some mechanism to reduce damage. Uh, it can actually be, there are a couple of examples where we're pretty good at building safe systems from unreliable components, kind of with redundancy, with fail-safe mechanisms. Um, and just focusing on reliable components might make things more unsafe. The typical example is a gas tank. If you make it with thicker and thicker walls, you make it less likely to burst. But if it actually bursts, then the damage is much, much bigger. Right? So it might be better to put in some other fail safes that you safely release some gas or slowly or things like this. So safety is really a system uh, concept. Right? It's, a, it's avoiding these different kinds of hazards and harms. Can we collect a couple of examples? There are a bunch of them in the news, uh, a bunch of them that you can probably think about. Systems with the machine learning components where wrong predictions have some sort of safety implications. We also talked about some of them earlier. Let, let's collect a bunch. Um, what are things that you can think of? Self-driving cars, right? Um, the Uber crash is kind of well known. Um, Danny, can you expand on fraud detection? Well, I was just thinking like uh, credit cards have some sort of fraud alerting mechanism. And with that, if you, um, since people start trusting it, if you don't identify actual fraud, then people could lose money or something. Okay, yeah. Probably also to some degree the other way around. If you have false positives, you can really stress out, stress out people. <laughs> yeah. Um, can maybe the police gets caught on you, things like this, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, bad recidivism prediction, um, right? So um, medical AI diagnosis machines, right? Um, fairly fairly obvious safety cases uh, or safety issues, right? So there are all kinds of these examples, right? So the robot uprising is maybe the extreme, but it's certainly a safety issue, right? If AI at some point takes over and, and, and wants to control us. Um, I think I've shown this earlier um, with kind of smart home systems. If they go offline, um, you might actually have problems where people start freezing in their apartments, right? Um, this is an example that just happened last year here in Pittsburgh, um, where these delivery robots uh, blocked the sidewalk or blocked the lower part of the sidewalk that the wheelchair user was trying to use. So the wheelchair user tried to cross the street and then couldn't get off the street because the robot was blocking it and wasn't leaving, right? It also wasn't going forward because there was a wheelchair user. And then the traffic lights changed and the, the user was kind of blocked in, in the middle of this, at the, the person was blocked in the middle of the street. Right, so nobody got hurt in the sense, but it's 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 a dangerous situation, and it's a it's an AI mechanism here that did the planning and that parked in the wrong way and didn't anticipate that somebody needs to get out of the way. Uh, things like this, right? Um, Safe driving cars is probably the most commonly cited examples and a huge challenge. Um, and this is widely recognized. So people who work in the automotive industry all say um, that it's really important to think about what they all want to use machine learning. It's really important to think about safety. Um, and it's very challenging to think about safety. And we don't really know how to do it yet. Right, so for safe driving cars. Um, and again, safety is a broad concept. Um, so we had some examples, um, or there are lots of examples of maybe damage to mental health. We had, uh, we talked about in the ethics lecture about um, polarization or cyberbullying on Facebook, which might be even promoted by the ranking algorithm um, that may lead to um, mental health problems. This has been studied for teenage 
just that there's a rise of mental health problems that might actually be related to social um, network use. Um, systems that are polluting the environment. There's a nice uh, example of an Amazon Echo device um, that started playing music very, very loudly while nobody was at home and annoying all the neighbors. Um, right, so the Amazon Echo device was throwing its own, own party at home um, while somebody was traveling. This is noise pollution at least, right? Uh, even though nobody was physically harmed immediately, um, this is causing uh, damage. And then there are lots of these discussions um, causing harm to society, poverty, polarization. We talked about feedback loops in predictive policing and kind of discrimination, uh, all kinds of fairness issues, right? Uh, recidivism prediction, if that's biased, um, polarization through, through uh, recommendation algorithms and social media and so on. So what I, why I'm talking about this is just to make sure that when we're thinking about safety, we're not just thinking about airplanes and self-driving cars that might kill somebody, right? It's a much broader concept, thinking about all kinds of harms uh, that can happen. Why is it so hard to get self-driving cars right? What makes self-driving cars so difficult? And I suspect a bunch of you have probably thought about self-driving cars way more than me uh, and know much more about this than me. But um, what makes self-driving cars difficult? Vivek, can you explain this a little bit? I mean, uh... If, if it is all machines, probably they are going to follow a certain path or certain rule. But when humans come into picture, like uh, needless to say, like they, they can go off the routes or anything. So it becomes really difficult for self-driving machines to follow the same algorithm. So, so what makes it difficult? To predict uh, essentially what human behavior is going to be. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so uh, we're trying to predict human behavior and humans are maybe hard to predict. Yeah. Um, other things that make it hard? Other things that make it hard? Leo, can you expand? Um, so <clears throat> so self-driving have based a lot on the, the sensor data, especially uh, so computer vision data to scan the surroundings, to identify maybe let's say the, the curb of the road, um, those kind of edges and boundaries, but under a lot of conditions, for example, foggy or rainy weather, or even just a very bright song, uh, the, the input data from the camera could be uh, affected. Um, and those will cause challenges for the, for the computer vision component to function properly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, uh, because I think the, as also some paper on computer vision pointed out, um, even without any of those extreme conditions, maybe a, an unexpected element that pops up in your, uh, in, your, in your camera footage could also screw up the entire computer vision component. Right. So, so we're training these models on training data and we can't really cover all possible cases. We can't really test all possible cases. And there are lots of these edge cases that we may not have any training data for, so it's kind of hard for a machine to predict what happens. Right, so here are a couple of things that as humans, we are probably okay at distinguishing this, right? We, we would recognize this is, this is just a weird looking car. There's not actually a plane here that we wouldn't expect and we probably wouldn't have had in any training data, right? Um, as humans, we can kind of deal with exceptional situations. Um, 
we might hard code something like this because this is maybe anticipated, but it's still, um, as humans, we are much better at dealing with kind of unanticipated ways, right? We have a better reasoning mechanism that at least we haven't invented to the same degree for artificial intelligence. So the way that most these mechanisms work right now is supervised machine learning, right? So it's kind of, you give it a bunch of examples and it generalizes. Um, and if it hasn't seen any examples like this, it wouldn't expect to, that this is a person or that this is a cow, right? Also classically, the, the way that we made cars safer um, over this kind of last century is um, design changes in cars that protect humans, like headrests, uh, wind, better windshields, safety belts, and then road improvements, center lanes, reflectors, rail guards, um, that usually help humans to make better decisions. So we are kind of putting in um, things that we're putting in things, um, safety mechanisms to help humans navigate better. Some of these safety mechanisms will also help us with self-driving cars, but we are taking humans out, right? So previously the idea was to help the humans to make better decisions. Now we're completely automating this. Um, there have been, there, there's a lot of hype around self-driving cars and there were a lot of very optimistic predictions and it's kind of consistently pushed back, right? So we have, great successes. Um, we had early safe driving cars, including here at Carnegie Mellon, driving across the sun, uh, country 20 years ago, um, but kind of really getting this into a production mode, right? So even with a lot of, oops, uh, a lot of um, kind of push forward is really hard, right? So it's really hard to really state the requirements that can be automated by a machine. Um, it seems unrealistic just having lots and lots of training data and getting to safe predictions this way. Um, right, so there's just so many edge cases, so many things that are hard to anticipate. What companies are doing these days is just driving more and more miles and demonstrating that the car works in practice. Um, but it's kind of hard to give any guarantees, right? And, or kind of showing that this is actually making it safe. Um, so to actually demonstrate safety, there are many different strategies. Um, a bunch of them we have already talked about. So um, I think a very useful thing is start about thinking about what are the hazards here? What kind of safety mechanisms are there? What are the requirements? What are the assumptions that we have about the environment? Right, so we talked about a bunch of these things already. So a hazard is the unintended outcome. So we want a safety requirement that kind of specifies the condition that we can avoid the hazard. Um, it helps to think in terms of the distinction of requirements, specifications, and kind of the environment assumptions. Right? Um, we talked about, uh, I thought I added an extra slide. We talked about the idea between the world and the machine quite a bit. Right, so there's a lot of discussion that, oh, here it is, um, that most safety issues are because of wrong requirements, interactions because, between requirements. Right, so software is never unsafe. Software doesn't do anything, right? The outputs where we are influencing actuators, that might cause unsafe conditions, right? The uns unsafe conditions, the hazards all happen in the real world. The software does something, but if the requirements are wrong, the software might be implemented to specification and still do the wrong thing. Like we talked about those examples, I think a bunch of times, like the airplane uh, shooting over the runway because the software didn't realize the, the way it was implemented, whether the airplane was detecting that it was on the ground was faulty, right? There was aqua planning and kind of landing sideways. So the software was implemented correctly, but we had the wrong assumption about what it means to be on the ground, right? And together this resulted in an unsafe condition where the output of the software, which was implemented to specification, didn't match what we were expecting, didn't match our assumptions, resulting in an overall unsafe system. So 
a lot of traditional safety work assumes faulty components and a lot of actual safety problems are wrong requirements. So both of these things are important. A lot of safety mechanisms that we have, we're talking about some of them, deal with redundancies and things like this. So this assumes faulty components and reacting to this. Um, but I think requirements analysis is at least equally important. It's actually interesting if we're thinking about machine learning components now, because there we don't have specifications and we actually assume that we have unreliable components. So it actually may make more sense uh, to even more strongly think about um, consequences of mistakes. Right, so we've talked about a bunch of these analyses, how we can find hazards uh, in an earlier lecture. We've talked about fault trees, which is kind of a backward analysis. So you think about um, a problem, a potential hazard and th think backward, what needs to happen to lead to that problem, right? And one of the things that might need to happen is a wrong prediction of a machine learning machine and the safeguard not working. And we talked about this. Um, we also talked about forward analysis, like failure mode and effects analysis, which thinks about kind of an inspection of every component. The component might fail. What are possible consequences, right? So this is going from component failures to hazards, whereas the other one is going from hazards to component failures or problems. Um, we briefly talked about um, um, HAZOP and uh, some other strategies that essentially go through kind of inspection mechanism. Most of these techniques are actually 50 years or older before we controlled most of our stuff with machines. Um, these are still very useful for component mistakes. And I think they are even more useful these days because we have machine learning components that are kind of inherently unreliable. Right, but it still is very important to think about the requirements, about the interactions of components and so on. Right, so we talked about this before. I don't wanna kind of go into this all over again, but kind of thinking about hazards, thinking about requirements, thinking about fallback mechanisms, safety mechanisms is very important, right? And there are lots of techniques for this. Any questions? Right. If you look into the machine learning literature, again, you see a lot of safety work reframed as testing and robustness. Um, we talked about robustness last lecture, is the idea that small perturbations to the input should not lead to a different output, right? Or we want to know that for this specific prediction here, we would have gotten the same prediction even around small perturbations of this thing. Um, the examples that people use for safety and security are slightly different here, right? So it's different kinds of attacks. Um, if you read robustness literature about safety, they are often talking about image recognition of street signs. For example, detecting, um, detecting stop signs in different conditions. So you can simulate, like the perturbation might be things like the camera is tilted, there's fog, in the image, right? So the image is kind of uh, that, or there's poor lighting. Um, you can also think of explicit adversarial attacks. So this is an example where somebody has successfully attacked some uh, recognition model to figure out where they need to put in stickers that this is no longer recognized as a stop sign. So this is kind of an adversarial attack. Right, in the safety setting, both kind of adversarial attacks where somebody tries to trick you into doing the wrong thing and just accidents where kind of poor lighting, fog or tilted camera result in issues, you want to defend against all of those, right? They're all relevant for safety. And again, the techniques are the things that we talked about last time, potential verification, potentially sampling around the neighborhood, a bunch of techniques to harden the model, to kind of learn models based on other models, smoothen the model, uh, things like this, right? So if you're thinking about using robustness verification for safety, you could, for example, handle robust predictions different from unrobust predictions, right? So this is the idea where you do online verification, even though it's very expensive still these days, where you would, if you detect a stop sign, 
you check whether you would reliably detect this or robustly detect this as a stop sign against different perturbation. And if yes, then it's clearly a stop sign. If you only maybe detect it as a stop sign, you might want to use a fallback mechanism. Right? Um, there are other strategies. We talked about this detecting outliers and inputs as potential attacks or as potential things that are kind of out of distribution, things that you haven't seen in training before, um, or kind of all these things, data augmentation simulation to, to find better models. Right, so all of that stuff is important. Same, same kind of techniques in the security and in the safety world. Um, and also the testing stuff that we talked about earlier, kind of curating data sets for critical scenarios, right? Um, having lots of pictures of stop signs and make sure that on stop signs, your quality doesn't degrade, even though it works on other signs better, might be very important. Right. Um, create test data specifically for difficult um, conditions, not just for the critical ones, and then have def different test sets monitor kind of accuracy, not just over all data, but on different subsets of data. And there are a bunch of cases where simulation seems kind of feasible. So in self-driving cars, a lot of people do a lot of testing in simulation as well, where they essentially simulate inputs under different conditions. So they synthesize the camera images uh, based on some simulation. They see whether it's robust to different settings there. Um, shadow deployment is something that we talked about before. Right? And in those cases, in the simulation scenario and in shadow deployment, you can also see, even after the fact, were all the things that you've seen robust? If there are things where you had predictions based on things that are not robust, can you go back and enhance uh, your training data, right? So those are the kind of things that people are thinking about here. Make sense? So I think not fundamentally new compared to what we talked about on Tuesday, uh, but kind of similar strategies. And then there are a bunch of uh, safety concerns that are maybe a little bit further out there. A bunch of them are relevant for reinforcement learning. Um, so there are a couple of examples where you give an AI a task and it does it, but it kind of has negative side effects, right? So Asimov's laws are kind of lots of stories about essentially giving a machine a task or a robot a task and then it does what you tell it to do, but it also does other things that you didn't anticipate, right? And then there's a lot of ways of thinking about um, what happens. Doesn't somebody know the paperclip scenario? The, um, this is a game implementing this, but this is also discussed. Um, what's this about? Has somebody seen this before? The idea is here, uh, this is a thought experiment um, this is a thought experiment that you design an artificial intelligence that's there to make paper clips, right? So something completely benign and you give it a lot of autonomy and essentially it makes paper clips and then it gets more efficient at making paper clips and more efficient, it automates it. It needs more and more energy to get paper clips. It doesn't care about humans. So it kind of mines the entire planet for uh, inputs it kind of harvests the entire energy of the sun. And at some point it might decide it might leave the planet and create paper clips somewhere else and so on, right? So the idea is that if you give it a singular goal, it may have really severe side effects, right? It does not care about the benefit of humankind. It, if it achieves making more paper clips, maybe it kills humans in the process. It doesn't even think about it, right? So the, the and this is a game that kind of plays around this. You're playing the AI and you're starting by clicking on paper clips and then you're automating things and then automating. And um, so this is in the very beginning of the game where just for the screenshot created 148 paper clips, you kind of create a lot of paper clips in the game. It's really simple, it's very addictive um, if you wanna waste an afternoon. Um, anyway, so the problem here is that it's can be really hard to define good goal or cost functions for 
especially more general artificial intelligence system. Right? So you're designing something in, in a system context, um, but the model might not understand it, right? So you, you tell as a goal function, do X, but you really mean perform X subject to some common sense constraints, which I can't really all list out now, right? Or perform X and avoid all kinds of side effects if possible. Do you have any other examples of kind of machine learning systems giving a task and kind of having really weird side effects? Wasn't there one in the reading where it was the, the autonomous vehicle was tricking the sensors or something so it could get a better driving score? Right, so, so, so there were two things. Uh, one is the other thing that I'm talking about. The one in the reading that relates here is if you go over the speed limit to reach a target faster, right? Um, so if you don't specify, like stick to all the rules, just get there fast, it might just drive at maximum speed. Um, other things? There are lots of AIs that have learned to play games in really weird ways and exploit all kinds of loopholes. But yeah, this, this kind of bleeds into the other problem, reward hacking. So if you have a specific goal function, AIs can be really good at finding shortcuts. There are lots of funny examples of, um, especially in the game area where kind of reinforcement learning is used a lot. For example, a game that doesn't want to lose a Tetris and learns to pause the game because then it doesn't lose, right? So it's kind of breaking the rules in a sense. Um, there's a bunch of things um, where the systems have learned to exploit bugs. There are examples of Super Mario where it exploits a bug to kind of go somewhere really fast or, or find these kind of things. Um, so this is, Again, when they're about to lose, they exploit a bug, make the other game uh, players disappear, and then it's a draw, right? Um, here's a self-driving cars that's rewarded for speed that learns to spin in circles, right? That's going very fast. The one from the reading was, um, if, it if it has a goal to never get too close to another car, it might learn that if it gets close enough to the other car, so very close, the sensor might actually not realize that it's really close to another car. Right, and this way it gets really close, but it kind of officially doesn't know it, right? It's still rewarded. Um, so so there, there are lots of these examples. Um, AIs can be really good at finding loopholes to achieve goals in unintended ways. It's technically correct, right? But again, it's a requirements problem. It's really hard to come up with the right reward functions. We typically have proxies. Um, we have feedback loops. Um, any other examples you may have seen of this? Have you seen any of those videos of AIs cheating at games? No. There are a bunch of them. They're fun. There's also one uh, where they're Play, learning to play hide and seek and they're learning to kind of um, put themselves inside a box and then they start cheating and they throw out things out of the game. They use exploits in the physics engine and, and things like this. Um, there are many, many of these examples. Um, and there are a bunch of others. Um, just in practice, kind of safe, safe exploration can be hard. So if you actually want to Experiment, try, learn in production. How do you do that? For example, if you try to learn how to fly a drone in production, how do you do this without being unsafe, right? Or modify something. Um, robustness to drift, scalable oversight. How can you kind of keep humans in the loop without kind of avoiding the entire point? Um, so there, there are lots of these challenges that go beyond just classic, do we recognize the same image? Classic design strategies for safety, they're a lot and they're all relevant here and I don't really wanna go into the details. So the, the, essentially you assume that components may fail at some point. So you kind of 
try to find mitigation strategies. You detect this when they fail, you control this, you prevent this, uh, you prevent defects. So there's a lot of these examples for detecting when something fails, like a heartbeat pattern or do checker pattern, um, where you essentially request, are you still up to date? Are, are you monitoring? Are you giving good predictions? And then if that thing fails, we, we take a corrective action, like rebooting something. Uh, you could think of this also in the machine learning scenario if you have a baseline mechanism that works without machine learning or with a safer version. For example, you can have a machine learning based controller and if that fails for whatever it means to fail, right? So for example, it might crash entirely, but it might also just kind of consistently give wrong predictions or give predictions that seem to be outside of the safety box. Um, then you have an alternative controller that hopefully doesn't use machine learning or uses more robust sensors, maybe derives way slower, right? But you can kind of fall back on this or can control the other system. Um, so, so there are a couple of ideas of how you can do this. There are a couple of ideas of graceful degradation. The video here doesn't work, but the idea is that um, if you have all your sensors, you can drive, um, the car can drive with kind of the, the usual kind of intended way, but if the camera fails, you might only use a LiDAR sensor or an alternative sensor, and maybe you limit the top speed, right? Because, and increase the distance to a car because it's less safe, you have less uh, higher error margins, so you, you switch over to, to an alternative system. A um, Couple of other things, redundancy is kind of a classic strategy, kind of hopes that failures are not correlated, Right, so in machine learning, that's already quite common with uh, ensemble learning where you have multiple models that hopefully don't make the same mistake. It doesn't really help. It may reduce the, the chance of an error, but it doesn't avoid it. Um, so there are a couple of different designs here. Um, and then you also want to decouple systems um, that the wrong prediction doesn't have cascading effects everywhere. There are lots of classic examples like this ship, um, there's a divide by zero um, mistake by entering invalid data in some part of the sh uh, ship and the entire system crashes, the entire onboard system crashes, and the ship is dead in the water for three hours until everything gets rebooted, right? So this is clearly not decoupled. Um, many traditional car systems are designed with a single bus, so a single point of failure, single point where you can access everything, right? Um, so if, if you can control the, 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 the audio system, for example, with a malicious MP3 file, um, there have been attacks like this, you might be able to get into the engine control system, right? And a clearer design is to actually decouple things, not to listen to things that are not relevant, to avoid hacking uh, in this way, right? So kind of classic decoupling strategies. There's a question of how far can you do this with a machine learning task, right? Um, there was a part of the reading where they discussed whether you should have one AI learning directly from sensor inputs to actuator outputs or whether you should decouple this into smaller systems. Um, it seems that the trend tends to go towards smaller systems that you have some control of isolating certain failures and understanding certain ones. Um, yeah, there are lots of classic examples of how you use those patterns and put in um, um, safeguards. So all of these help if you have unreliable components, which I think we have with machine learning, um, but still focus on the requirements as well, right? Um, but assume machine learning ma systems make mistakes. We don't have specifications. It's hard to predict and understand when the mistakes happen, right? They are not correlated. They're not um, Understandable interpretability helps to some degree because we might have confidence in some predictions, but it's probably not a general solution. Because we, the main problem here is we're trying to do really complicated things, right? And we don't understand really what exactly we are doing. Um, so we don't have full specifications. It's easy to make mistakes. Um, yeah, anyway. Let's talk a little bit about self-driving cars. Um, again, I'm not an expert here. I suspect a bunch of you know more. Um, self-driving cars are way easier if you control the environment, 
Right, so there have been really successful deployments of self-driving cars for multiple years in scenarios of strip mines and um, like long dedicated highways in Australia and, and things like this. Right, so if you know that there are not humans in the way behaving in unexpected weird ways, right? If, if it's only cars on these roads, uh, it's much, much easier to get this right. Um, the problem with kind of self-driving cars is that we want to get to full autonomy in interaction with human drivers and in interaction with humans who might walk into the road, or things like this. Um, yeah, you read this that um, kind of current standards are probably not particularly prepared for machine learning. Right? There's a lot of discussion these days, but a lot of companies from my understanding is, are trying to figure out what can we do about safety? How can we think about safety with machine learning? Um, let me get back to this in a second. Has anybody ever looked into what actually happened in the Uber crash? What was causing this? So to my understanding, I think it was, it was dark at night. Uh, I think it was in Arizona and mm -hmm. um, there was a person who I think was on drugs, which contributed to their behaving irregularly um, in the road. And then the person riding in the Uber vehicle who was supposed to be acting as a fail safe, wasn't paying attention. I think they might've been watching Netflix mm -hmm. or something. And so I guess, due to the sum of all those factors, the car failed to react, I think. Right, so there's, as in all these cases, there's, there's lots of things that come together when things actually go wrong. You can look this in essentially every single big safety analysis, um, security also to some degree, there are usually multiple safe, fail safes that all failed. So in this case, um, yeah, it was difficult situations. The pedestrian was also um, pushing a bike, uh, which made it harder to detect, I think. It was dark. Um, the machine learning model didn't reliably detect the pedestrian and their kind of trajectory early enough. Um, they blamed it mostly on human error, right? So there was a driver in the car who was technically responsible as a fail safe. But as Jake said, the uh, driver was distracted, um, doing stuff on their phone. The, um, but there were more things that, um, that fed into this. So the Volvo that they were using had some safety features um, that would actually have beeped loudly to remind the driver, but they dis deactivated the safety features of the car to kind of, because they had their own mechanisms. Um, the, in the report that came out afterward also blamed Uber for having a lack of a safety culture, just in general. They weren't taking safety serious. They also had organizational issues, like nobody higher up responsible for safety, no organizational structure for safety. Um, they blamed also regulators that they allowed people just to, or companies just to drive, test drive cars without kind of regulations. Um, Uber also decided to have fewer drivers in the car. Um, so they switched from two drivers to a single driver um, just a few weeks earlier, which might contribute to somebody paying less attention because people are not checking on each other. Um, so again, many different problems. There's a wrong prediction certainly in there, but there are also a bunch of fail safes that didn't work. There are a bunch of um, regulatory and kind of certification things that maybe haven't happened. And in the end, it's always easy to blame a driver. So I didn't have this in my slides here, but um, in most safety cases, the formal reports blame the operator. So this has happened two years ago now that there was, this was big in the news also that everybody in Hawaii received kind of an uh, emergency alert on their phone um, that there's an incoming ballistic missile. This caused panic for at least half an hour 
Um, so a lot of people were taking this serious, right? This was overwhelming uh, emergency responses and so on. Um, this was sent by accident. It was later claimed this was an operator error, right? So this is a test system where somebody pushed the wrong button. Instead of sending the test, they sent the real thing. Then if you actually look at how the system was designed, there was, I think, what was it? Um, this is the message that got sent. And this is the test message that they should have clicked. Or the, the drill one, where's the drill one? This one, this one was the one that they should have clicked. And there was no kind of confirmation or this was the same confirmation that they clicked away. They do this test regularly, right? So kind of blaming the operator is easy, but this is clearly a system to be designed, not to be designed to make it easy for the operators, right? Also Chernobyl is blamed on the operators. And if you look at the setting, um, what actually happened is there were a lot of things that made it really hard for the operators. The, um, um, the Boeing um, 787 MAX, I think, is blamed on the pilots, right? But then if you look into how the pilots were trained um, or not trained um, to react to those situations, it's kind of questionable whether it's fair to expect them to react correctly in those situations. In the same way, here they blamed the driver right, who was distracted. And there were certainly faults here, but its system is also designed to be autonomous and kind of asking, telling somebody that the system is autonomous, but you have to pay attention the entire time makes it really hard, right? It, uh, it's easy to become compliant with this. There's a lot of discussion also around the Tesla autopilot feature, which is kind of marketed as self-driving, but still, all the technical documentation says it's a driver assistant feature. It's not actually self-driving. You have to pay attention the entire time. So if something goes wrong, it's your fault as a driver, right? But you see lots of videos of people essentially not paying attention, uh, letting the thing drive, and most of the time it works, right? Um, it's part of a liability question and part of this also kind of a system design question. How much do you expect people to be in the loop and how do you engage them to have a safe environment where the automation and the human work together well? Have you seen these uh, self-driving levels? So there's a discussion around different levels of self-driving car features. Um, level zero just means no self-driving features. Um, Level one and two are some automation features that support the drivers. This is not technically self-driving. This is things like lane assist. Um, uh, in the lower level, I think level one, it may beep. And in the higher level, no, oh wait. Um, in the lower level, it only affects steering or um, speed like lane centering or cruise control, adaptive cruise control. In level two, you can have both at the same time. Um, but still, at level one and two, it's still the driver is fully responsible for everything that happens. These are assistant features. With level three, four, and five, we get into places where we talk about full autonomy. So this is where the driver is no longer driving, it's a car that's taking the action. The question is, where can it drive? So level five essentially says this vehicle can drive under any condition, right? It's no bad condition, bad lighting, inner city, highway, everything. Whereas level three says the feature must be requested or the, the system can drive in some condition, but it may tell you, please take over as a driver when it, uh, can no longer function. Level four, it will only drive under some conditions. For example, it may drive only in Pittsburgh roads, which is maybe a little bit harder, uh, or only on highways, right? But it's fully autonomous in those situations or only in nice weather condition. Um, so classic example is a traffic jam chauffeur, which is essentially in a traffic jam, it supports it, it's fully auto autonomous. Uh, you're technically 
don't need to pay attention, right? It's intended to be autonomous, but as soon as the traffic jam is over, you're supposed to take over. So right now, so we have deployed these kind of level one and level two features on many, for many years, right? So there are lots of cars like adaptive cruise control is super convenient, lane centering works well, kind of the Tesla stuff is technically in this area, I think mostly, and it can automate a lot of things, but technically the driver's in charge. We have very few systems of higher levels. Technically, we are starting to get pretty good at stuff in level three and four. So in certain conditions like highway driving, we can almost entirely automate. We don't have pedestrians that we have to worry about. Um, the, we don't have intersections. Um, it's relatively easy for the most part. This is mostly soft. Um, the thing that we're really struggling with is level five, which is kind of always the ambition, but seems something that seems very far out of reach still. Right. This is where you need to think about all the cases uh, working in all possible conditions. But this is actually what most people are, I think, working toward. The, my understanding of the debate is that we will probably get to level three or four and are happy with what we have without ever getting to level five. So it might be much easier to just ban humans driving cars and drive under controlled conditions and try to work in all conditions. It might be much easier to have self-driving cars in a specific city where you have very good maps um, that it works, that you have backup information and so on. And so for example, stop sign detection and robustness one, one strategy to deal with that is instead of having, focusing and relying so much on the visual recognition of the stop sign, have a map that tells you where all the stop signs are and have GPS as a backup or kind of to correlate those two things, right? If you have very good maps and you kind of keep humans out, it's much easier. So kind of self-driving on highways. So trucks on highways, I think, are something that we're probably seeing much earlier than kind of really self-driving cars that work in all situations. Does this match your understanding? Any, any nerds about self-driving cars that know more in this area you wanna share? No? Usually when I talk about self-driving cars, there are some people in the room that know way more about this or are way more optimistic or pessimistic about this. All right. Um, So there are a couple of things that I think we can do at the system level. This comes out of a follow-up paper of what you read um, that much, in much more detail goes into strategies that are used. So ensemble learning, uh, where you, for example, use multiple classifiers for pedestrian detection instead of just a single one, helps to deal with single points of failure, right? Um, again, up to a degree, uh, you still have failures where they kind of um, all fail. Safety envelopes, I think, is something that people are pushing very heavily. Um, try to have a non-machine learning based backup mechanism that kind of gives you the boundaries of what we consider as safe, right? So kind of worst case, like distance sensors or so that we use with non-machine learning. And then we use machine learning on top of that to make decisions within the safe boundaries only. This is kind of a classic safety strategy. Um, have kind of an architecture where you have both conservative and better approaches and you can decide which ones you're using. Um, some runtime verification of some partial specification. Um, uh, keeping telemetry for, for later retraining and better analysis. So there are a couple of kind of classic safety patterns that also make sense here. Um, maybe a couple of other interesting things. So I talked about this. There have been studies of bugs in self-driving cars, which I found quite interesting. Um, 
actually the so these were bugs that were filed against the version control system or the bug tracker in in some production um, systems for self-driving cars the bugs that they found were mostly fairly traditional bugs not a lot of safety bugs so a lot of kind of just traditional configuration bugs build errors um, documentation bugs but then also all kind of ai components were affected like planning components perception and localization components often changes to those components included quite significant changes to the implementation so not just one line of code um, often non-trivial, affected many different systems as a wrong speed um, or wrong direction. But most of the bugs that they found in this study were actually not safety critical or not yet, maybe they didn't get to that stage, right? Uh, but I think the point here is that even if we're writing these kind of systems, we still have to think about all the traditional software engineering techniques um, as well. Um, Again, this is what I showed earlier. People are very well aware that this is hard and people are struggling mightily with this. Um, this is another study where they interviewed automotive engineers in a lot of companies. Um, there's no agreement on how to actually develop these things safely right now, uh, or at least two years ago when the study was done. Um, the research seems to focus on showcasing attacks and robustness improvements less on safety uh, system level engineering practices process practices right again um, safety issues are often kind of requirements issues um, are often issues with safeguard mechanisms right robustness in the model alone will not help us we still have unreliable components um, there's a spirit in the ai community of kind of pioneering doing new things with kind of more conservatism in safety engineering and automotive communities and so on. And practitioners don't want to do the formal stuff and probabilistic proofs. They much more prefer simulation and tests, at least right now. But I think that's something that you see in a lot of communities as well, that there's kind of resistance against more formal approaches. And right now it seems that it's still really hard to figure out how can we ever get certification uh, or what kind of regulation should we have? There's a lot of discussion around this. How do we ever get to a point where the driver is not liable, right? And uh, we're not getting sued as a car company if the car crashes. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done. Um, yeah, all stuff that we can talk. So if traditional verification doesn't work, what can we do? I honestly don't know. People talk about a bunch of things, mostly think about system design, think about traditional ways to deal with unreliable components, think about verifications, but more importantly, testing, testing, testing. Simulation is something that people seem to like in this area. Focus on data quality and robustness. Adopt a system level perspective, focus on requirements. Um, consider the yeah, traditional safe design mechanisms for unreliable components but really think about requirements, understand the problem, understand the hazards, um, think about how these pieces interact. Um, but probably also follow, follow the current research on safety. Um, um, there's a lot of stuff that happens, uh, thinking about what are the safety problems, the safety properties, what verification techniques are, hopefully at some point they are cheap enough that we can use them at runtime in realistic scenarios. Think about attacks, think about the defenses. There's a lot of stuff that happens. There's some community that's evolving or emerging on human and machine learning interaction. There are also things about compliance problems and kind of uh, getting fatigue of overseeing things and so on. And really, just don't forget the basics, right? Don't forget requirements, engineering, hazard analysis, classic configuration management, the kind of things that we talked about, versioning and reproducibility, um, right? And classic testing approaches. Make sense? And after talking about self-driving cars and kind of the clear, kind of the typical safety Critical systems are always kind of nuclear power plants, cars, um, airplanes. This is what people talk about. But I think I mentioned this in the beginning. I want to come back. Safety is not just for those systems. 
pretty much or very many systems. You might not go out and actually work on a nuclear power plant or a self-driving car, maybe just on a web system, but actually a lot of those systems have some safety component or some safety aspect. And I think it's really important to think about this. Um, we may not have the legal obligation to think about safety implications of designing a ranking algorithm in Facebook, but maybe we have an ethical ob obligation, right? So maybe we should think about this. Maybe we should also regulate this at some point. Um, many end user applications actually have safety implications. Um, I'm gonna make you look at your phone in a second, uh, but if you think about things, when they started Twitter, they didn't think about the reach that they have, the kind of amplification of speech that they would reach. Um, they didn't use machine learning in the beginning to amplify speech that might cause um, filter bubbles, that might cause polarization. Um, Facebook is the same thing, right? Um, but there's a stage where it might actually be worth thinking about those things, thinking about how does amplification through machine learning, through recommendation algorithms actually have an impact on mental health, on physical well-being, on stress, on the communities at large. Right. Um, oh, by the way, this is a screenshot from the very early days of Twitter. Um, this is how they designed it, right? How, what are you doing? It has changed quite a bit. Um, I've shown I've shown you this before, right? Um, kind of social media linked to increases in depression and loneliness. Um, this is the thing about uh, thermostats going down, um, addiction, kind of simple design mechanisms, machine learning or not, how to A-B testing draws us in, causes uh, addiction, right? How we design applications that are not traditionally safety critical in a way that we, we're addicting people. Um, how we may have implications on society, unemployment engineering and de-skilling um, and polarization. Um, energy consumption, there's a lot of discussion around how deep learning is really sometimes not much more effective, but usually it takes way more energy than alternative le learning strategies. Should we use it for all kinds of things? And in the last five minutes that I have, I, I just want you to look at your phone at a bunch of apps and think about kind of apps that you have that maybe use machine learning somewhere and think about whether you see anything that has any safety implications, even if it's relatively small. Anything you're seeing? I was just thinking like uh, Snapchat or Instagram, anytime you're like, uh, it can like suggest you like those public videos to watch um, based on what you've watched and uh, probably can cause narrow-mindedness because you start just suggesting things that the person's already interested in or mm -hmm. what they've watched before and you yep. don't get differing opinions i guess yep filter bubbles um there's also the the case with recommending conspiracy theory videos yeah okay. um, anything else you're seeing anybody else i have an app that um it does like transit information so um, one of the things is it predicts when the next train or bus could come and if they come pretty infrequently um, and you're waiting for a bus or a train late at night, you might be putting yourself in danger. Mm -hmm. If you think it's come, it's going to come and you miss it because it, it takes longer to come yep. or it comes more quickly than, than you can get to the bus stop, et cetera. Yep. yep. Anybody else? Well, I use a lot of banking apps and today I would try to transfer some money and they stopped me from doing so despite the fact that I've been using this IP address and I've been a loyal customer of theirs for five years. Mm -hmm. um, largely probably because I performed an action that was highly unusual for like my track record. Like I mm -hmm. transferred money and I never transferred money out of this account before. Mm -hmm. So they said, please call 
to verify yourself. And I thought, okay, that's good and bad. Like it's good security and terrible for customer experience. And it depends on what situation you're in. This might be actually pretty bad. Right, right. Um, right. Yeah, so I think these are these are all good examples and they kind of go all into the same theme, right? So it's not immediately killing you, any of those things, right? It's not a self-driving car that kills a person. It's not a plane crashing. And there's this borderline between what's, like none of these things are illegal either, right? But it's easy to design these systems and implement these systems and use machine learning without thinking about the consequences. Maybe they have thought about the consequences, right? In the fraud detection mechanism, probably somebody has thought about the upsides and downsides and made some trade-off decision. But overall, I think it's, it's worth to think about these things, think about hazards up front, um, think about what can go wrong. Um, and even if it's just, just pollution, stress, um, right, but also mental health, discrimination, things like this. All right, that's all I have. Um, so I'm not a safety expert, but the, the whole theme here is really adopt a safety mindset. It's a system level property. Think about requirements, think about uh, unreliable components, think about safety envelopes, backups, uh, things like this. And it's not just killing people, right? Um, assume that all machine learning components will eventually fail in one way or another. Um, it's also really hard to specify goals if you go into more sophisticated AI techniques, right, without side effects and reward hacking. Um, but we have a bunch of techniques, sometimes 50 years ago, that will help us to understand our requirements, that will help us to think about um, backup strategies, safety mechanisms, and so on. Um, and I think also work on model robustness can help to some degree. Right. So it will not be a full solution, but it can give us more confidence. That's all I have. Um, we have one more lecture next week on where I want to talk about teams and kind of interdisciplinary teams and working together. And then the last lecture is essentially a summary. And then you have presentations on, first, uh, on Friday. All right. Let me stop the recording and then.